afternoon. It is a, a wonderful pleasure to be here sharing with you and uh, building upon the very important work that the Heidelberg Center for the Environment is doing and being part of this work. Um, I will try to share my screen. Um, please bear with me for a moment and um, hopefully it will um, work out. So um, yes, just one second. Yes, so the first thing I want to do is simply to acknowledge and to emphasize how important the work that the Heidelberg Bridge is doing. Um, I think we are, we are talking about a bridge. We are talking about a bridge between policy and research, or between research and policy. And uh, that is not something we see very often in, in academic institutions. And uh, we are also talking about building a bridge between different um, areas of research, including research on climate change and mitigation, not simply from the usual perspective of the EU or the nor Northern countries, but from the Global South as well. You have had uh, some interesting talks uh, on this issue. Um, questions having to do with different aspects of the global carbon cycles. And um, I think this has different elements which are extremely important to, to keep into consideration, um, even when it sounds like something very esoteric. Um, the connection between global climate and regional political economies. Um, we've had examples of, of talks on this by Professor Koch on the Middle East, um, on the post-Soviet area, um, including my talk and others, uh, issues of governance and climate change. And I also want to acknowledge uh, important work on international private law as related to governance of energy and climate change and really um, I don't know whether she has given a talk in this series, but um, Simon's, my host's own work on this area is, is important and is an element of governance of energy and climate change that should not be neglected. So thank you for including me in your series. Um, I'd like to say a few words about myself. Um, my host um, was very kind in, in the way she described my work. Um, the most important things that I think you need to understand about me is that I'm a Latin American. I was born in Argentina, grew up there and in Puerto Rico, but all my life, uh, since age 16, I have been working with the former Soviet world. Um, I'm one of these people who became, um, whose life was transformed by learning Slavic languages. In my case, it's first Russian and later on Ukrainian and Belarusian. And I've spent many, many years uh, combining my work as a quote unquote, boring professor in the United States with field research in Eastern Europe. And uh, I'm glad I did that because that's going to be much more difficult now, uh, especially concerning Russia. And finally, for good or for bad, I have been happily swimming in Soviet and post-Soviet fossil fuels for many years. Um, this is for good because I know that part of the post-Soviet political economy very well. Whether you think fossil fuels are good or bad, they have shaped that region. Um, and this is bad because we need to move beyond fossil fuels. And like many other researchers in that part of the world um, and many policymakers in that part of the world, I think we, our views are still very much shaped by the tremendous importance and weight of fossil fuels in that part of the world. So I acknowledge that. Um, if I have time, I will tell you about my new research project, and um, you will see how I'm moving, uh, building upon that reality, but moving forward into new questions. So I'm here to talk about a book, but more than a book. Um, the book's Russian Energy Chains. I hope that you will read it. Uh, it's quite likely that your library has an electronic copy, so you don't even have to buy it. Uh, but what I'd like to do is not to dupl duplicate the story told in this book, which I certainly cannot summarize in just 30 minutes, but use the prism of the new reality we are seeing after Russia's all-out invasion of Ukraine in, on February 24th to highlight some aspects of this book or of the analytical framework presented in this book that gain new value and new power after February 24th. So this book was published uh, just before Russia's all-out inv invasion. Um, um, and what is interesting for me is that the new situation highlights some other elements that were kind of dormant in the book, but which now 
uh, gain new importance in, in my understanding. So the first thing I'd like to do is tell you a history of how I got into that work, um, which is uh, also the history of different elements of my attempts to understand the role of energy and yes, fossil fuels in the post-Soviet political economy. So basically I started to work on this area about 20 years ago when I uh, arrived at Harvard University as a, as a Ford Foundation <clears throat> uh, Minority Research uh, Fellow, uh, postdoc. And what you could see at that time in US literature on the region and whatever was discussed about energy in the region was a very generalized discussion of Russia's energy weapon. There was a constant reference to the Russian energy weapon, but it was never ex clearly explained what this meant. And I was very unhappy with this use of the phrase. And I was unhappy with the fact that that phrase treated energy as an undifferentiated whole. Um, as if different types of energy were not different or did not interface with power in different ways. Um, that line of research did not treat technology seriously. Um, and also, uh, that image of the Russian energy weapon treated former Soviet Union energy dependent states, not only Ukraine, but other states from Ukraine to Belarus to Moldova to others as simply victim entities, simply subjects of Russian policy with little agents of their own. And that seemed to be rather contradictory since we were supposed to support these things. And um, to deal with this, I tried to say, well, if this uh, literature, if this way of looking at things assumes um, that these states are simply subjects of Russian policy, what would happen if we look at these states and what is actually happening uh, in these states? What happens if we stop looking at them as simply subjects, but also, sorry, as simply objects, but also as subjects? What happens if we actually look at the black box of what is happening uh, in energy policy and politics there? And that's exactly what I did. <clears throat> I spent more than 10 years working on this and I published three books uh, on these uh, issues related to this. And obviously I spent uh, several years of field research in, in the countries uh, at that time. It was not easy because it's much easier to just sit in Moscow and try to understand everything from Moscow. It's not easy to learn other languages or to take the effort to use local sources, but that's exactly what I did. And um, what I did through this work was try to try to understand this black box and in trying to understanding, to understand this black box, I realized that they are and there were winners and losers of different energy policies. There were very important issues of governance and corruption. There were issues of hijacking of state energy policy. And uh, in particular, I'm gonna tell you very briefly about each of these uh, books uh, because they allowed me to get different perspectives of a single issue. Uh, the first book in this series was focused on Ukraine and in what I would call the classic period of Ukrainian post-independence energy policy, 1995-2006. And uh, basically this is a book um, that deals with the question of how, does the, how do domestic political factors affect energy policy? And what I learned through this work was that actually, and this is very sad to say, at least during this period, Ukraine did not really have a proactive energy policy, rather energy policy was a byproduct of a lot of other things that were happening uh, in politics and in political economy, in particular the bargaining between different oligarchy groups. Uh, this is largely a book about corruption, about how corruption takes different forms in different areas of energy, but uh, it's a very deep look at the way governance and governance problems affected energy policy. Um, whether this has changed or not is a different story, but it's important to acknowledge that during this classic period of, of Ukrainian energy policy, that was the reality. Uh, a second book on the series tried to take a comparative perspective. And what I did is I took three post-Soviet states which shared a common energy dependency on Russia. And I, my original idea 
was to try to understand how, in the case of each three states, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania, my original question was, how did domestic political issues, how did different types of political regimes, how did governance issues affect energy policy? So my idea was that these different political, de facto political systems in these three states would affect energy policy and energy uh, relations with Russia, which indeed uh, I found out it affects it. But what I did also find out through this work is that you actually had a circular relationship because the way the energy relationship with Russia was managed in each of the states came back in a feedback loop to affect the domestic political governance system as well. Um, and I think that was, uh, that was a very important understanding of the tremendous short-term and middle-term, mid-term impact of energy policy in these states. The third and last book in this series is a book about Belarus. I do realize that not many people work on Belarus, but I did have the uh, um, great opportunity of being a Fulbright Fellow in Belarus and to go there many, many times. Um, and in this book, I don't know if you can see the cover, uh, you have a crown, that is the crown of the um, Belarusian autocrat, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, and uh, the jewels of the crown are petrochemical towers. And what I did in this, in this book is I tried to understand um, the larger question of how do domestic and external politics interface to support authoritarian resilience, but also, um, in particular, how a small energy dependent state, which is seen as a client state, how a small state can manipulate both materially and discursively its relationship with a much larger patron state to gain certain advantages. And I did that through looking in particular at the oil refining sector which has many particularities, which I will discuss in a moment when I talk about Russian energy chains, which allowed Lukashenko to manipulate that relationship um, uh, with Moscow. Uh, so the title of this book is Living the High Life in Minsk. This refers to about a 10 year period when the manipulation of that energy relationship allowed that regime to accumulate enough capital to ensure popular compliance. But if you look at the, uh, the subtitle, <laughs> Uh, Russian energy rents, domestic populism, and Belarus impending crisis. And what we have now is indeed that impending crisis where Belarus has to pay the bill for, for that uh, situation. Maybe we'll have time to talk about that later on. So uh, as you can see, I took very seriously the need to look at the black box of what happens in this state. And that certainly um, led to a lot of work on governance and corruption. But by looking at this black box, uh, I very slowly, and, and I have to accept that I'm very slow, uh, I got to understand that above and beyond the issue of corruption and rent seeking, which had played such a prominent role in, in my work, there's, there was a deeper issue, a deeper tension having to do with ambiguous attitudes in each of the states, ambiguous attitudes towards participation in Russian energy chains, energy chains related to the export or re-export of Russian energy resources. On the one hand, all the states stated that they wanted to establish energy supply diversification and infrastructure. Some of them said that in a more authoritative manner. In other cases, you would not really believe it. Um, but in each of these states, even the three states I compared in my, in my 2013 book, Belarus, Ukraine, and Lithuania, in each of the states, they also wanted at the same time to strengthen the country's role in that uh, value chain of Russian energy exports. Why? Uh, perhaps because of the desire to access spillover profits from Russian exports, be it in the form of transit fees, be it in the form of additional profits you can make 
through the re-export of oil as refined products, be it through using this role as transit or as transformation element to maintain some leverage in the energy relationship with Russia, but also perhaps as a way of accessing some de facto security guarantees. If you look at the case of Ukraine, for example, even when after Ukraine, quote unquote, gave up its uh, nuclear uh, weapons and it received security guarantees from Russia, the US and the UK, um, Many in Ukraine believe that the only way to really have some security guarantees was to be included in some larger triangular relationship, including the European Union, for example, through the role in energy transit. So even if you don't think about corruption, even if you don't think about some specific corrupt actors whose interests were closer to their wallets or to Russian interests and to their own country's interests, that um, ambiguous attitude was there. And I think this is, uh, this is what um, motivated uh, this work on, on this book. And um, when I started to work on this, I understood that participation in those chains were not seen, was not simply about threat, threat from Russia, but it was also about opportunity and even temptation. And not only for corrupt actors, but for a variety of actors uh, at all levels of, of society. Um, and to do this, um, I needed to move conceptually away simply from the idea of supply, away from the idea of simply saying Russia supplies a certain percentage, 80% or 90% or 98% of the Moldova. Um, you needed to look at the entire value chain or supply chain. I have a discussion in my book about why value chain is better than supply chain. Um, and you needed to understand that entire value and supply chain because to understand power projection by Russia, for example, you cannot do that if you do not look at how those supply chains interface and penetrate local politics uh, in a way that includes a variety of actors. And um, I think this is what motivated me to look at this issue, at these questions, not simply through the issue of supply, but through the issue of entire value chains. And that's exactly what I did. I tried to look at the value chain of Russian exports. And here we have, you know, this is a very simplified uh, scheme, but basically in the upstream, you have production, uh, mainly in Siberia, Western Siberia, the midstream, in my case, is through transit through Ukraine and the downstream end users in Europe. In my book, uh, all the end users are in Germany. I wanted to have um, a very clear endpoint. And here I have uh, three end users uh, in Germany. Um, so what I actually do in the, in the book is I follow three exemplary chains. So these are really existing chains, um, which were, it was not very easy to document them as really existing because you have a lot of commercial intelligence and, and other issues, but these are three um, documented chains moving uh, very specific energy molecules, a natural gas molecule, an oil molecule, a coal molecule from Siberia to Germany via Ukraine. And basically the, the bulk of the book is what I would call a travelogue of these three molecules, how each of these molecules travels from Siberia through Ukraine to Germany and what happens uh, and how the encounters this molecule has are both conditioned by governance issues, but also affecting them in a technical way. So my original interest in, in working on this book was theory related. I wanted to answer a theory related question about the role of materiality. How do the different the distinct physical characteristics of different energy types affects power relations. Again, if you remember the beginning of my talk, I was very unhappy about the way energy was dealt with in a very generalized matter. Um, I knew already from my own work that the materiality of different types of energy would affect transportation, for example. And I will get back to that in a moment. But in this book, I wanted to go farther and I wanted to see how those materiality characteristics would even affect the role different types of energy could have domestically as well. So that was the theory question. Um, 
I also have a, an empirical question, and that is very simply how has participation in these Russian energy chains affected power relationships, in particular the role of domestic actors, and historically, of course, uh, how did this participation shape uh, life in post-Soviet societies? Um, actually, as I look back at this work under the thunder of war, I realize that a lot of the elements of this analysis are not only valid for post-Soviet societies, they also include a lot of issues, for example, related to the participation of European Union players, including German players as well. Um, I also try to go beyond a purely academic book. So um, in contrast to a lot of books, I am not dealing with only one type of energy, but with three types of energy across three areas. And using the idea of a travel, I try to make it easier uh, for the reader, um, bringing the reader into that flow from Siberia to Germany. Also, um, understanding the importance of technical processes but helping the reader gain that knowledge through explaining these technical processes that are going to be important by having a glossary in this and trying to make it also um, accessible to students. And certainly, um, perhaps the country have done the most work on is Ukraine, but the issue of threat and temptation as related to participation in this Russian energy chains does not refer only to Ukraine. We saw this in other former Soviet states, even Lithuania, which was one of the first to seek to move away from Russian fuels. We saw that and continue to see that in the case of Belarus, but we continue to see that in other states. We saw that very clearly in European Union states, including Germany, concerning the issue of Nord Stream and Nord Stream 2, the coalition of actors which coalesce around their interests in Nord Stream 2, which included not only political actors, but also local actors in some specific regions of Germany. Uh, we saw that in the larger issue of profitable joint ventures with Russian energy companies, which we saw in a variety of European Union states, um, and also in the case of countries like Norway, um, the role of energy technology exports to Russian companies and how that bound um, Western European countries to a certain relationship with Russia. So that threat and temptation, um, again, is not only limited to a transit country such as Ukraine. Um, so what I would like to do now, um, very briefly, so that we have time for discussion, is to give you a very um, brief glimpse into some key concepts that are uh, developed in the book and how they may help us understand the current situation. Obviously, it's uh, 5.30. I will only very briefly um, talk about these concepts. Next week, when I present in Professor Koch's seminar, I will talk more about this. Um, but I simply want to uh, flag them as things that we may want to keep in mind, even after many aspects of the energy situation have changed after February 24th. And the first issue is the impact of materiality. And in, in my analysis, it's about the materiality of different types of energy and how that affects what you can do with it. It may have to do with how you can transport it, how you may transport it profitably, not profitably, but also how, how that transportation can be disrupted. Um, it also affects what transit countries can do or may not do. And it also uh, has to do with some of the issues related to the current situation, including the situation of sanctions and the European Union's desire to move away from Russia. How does the materiality of energy affect the possibility of actually moving away from different types of uh, Russian energy and how does it affect Russia's ability to sell those goods in other markets? Um, the second key concept is the concept of a whole value chain analysis. And here, I, I dig deeply into the issue of why it is important to look, on the one hand, not simply at 
at supply, but at the entire chain. And secondly, not simply at supply chains, but at the value chains. And there is a difference between supply chain and, and value chain. Um, I don't have anything against supply chains, but if you add the additional gaze of the value chain, especially in goods that have a tendency to have deep swings in value, this gives you a better understanding of the way in which those materiality differences may play a role in power relations. And I will talk more about that next week at Professor Fox's um, seminar. Uh, the third key concept is the concept of energy political systems. And basically this has to do with the fact that we cannot consider energy systems as only energy systems, only technical systems. Certainly the entire te technical side is very important. Certainly in this book it is because materiality is about technical constraints and how they may be used by actors. But you need to understand the energy system as all the things that energy produces. And in the case of post-Soviet state, in the case of Ukraine, for example, it produced not only energy, but also currency for certain political bargains, rents, systems of social provisioning, and, and so on. Um, the fourth key concept is the importance of contracts. And again, here, this takes me back uh, to something I mentioned at the beginning concerning the role of private law. Um, we often think simply about energy security and energy policy at the level of the EU or individual states, but actually looking at contracts. Uh, the fine print in contracts can give you very important cues as to how certain things happened or did not happen. And also gives us very important cues about how European Union states got to the place they found themselves in in February 2024, 20, sorry, 22nd, because um, if you look at the entire way in which the system of provisioning from the Soviet Union and then Russia was built, it had an, a technical element, it had an energy security element, but it brought together both the building of that large technical system and the building of a contractual system, basically built specifically for those large exports, and a contractual system which up to our day continues to largely limit what can be done, do, can be done with energy, in particular with natural gas. Here I have the cover of a very important book that can give you a lot of clues for understanding this issue by uh, per Hoxelius, the Sw Swedish historian of technology, who is also a member of my study group on energy materiality at the Hans Edition Sachs Collect, and I highly recommend that you read this book um, because it's, um, it gives you a lot of cues for understanding what is happening in the European Union now and how we got from 2014, the beginning of Russian aggression on Ukraine, to 2022 with the all-out invasion. Um, I would like to end by saying that there are really important issues um, that should be in our radar, issues having to do with the way energy is not simply energy, but energy plays a role in industry and embedded energy plays a role in a different set of issues, including issues having to do with EU policies, such as carbon adjustment issues, um, how these issues are going to be really key for countries like uh, Ukraine, Russia, and China. And basically this brings me back to the beginning of my of our conversation where I emphasize the need to look at energy, not simply at the supply of one fossil fuel, but at the various role, roles that energy types play in the economy as a whole. Um, I want to thank all these different institutions that helped me uh, bring together this project, bring it to successful completion. And if you're still curious, you may want to look at my book. Um, you may want to come uh, next week to my presentation at Professor Fox's seminar. And uh, I'm really happy to engage in discussion and uh, fair debate. Thank you so much. <laughs>